Jerry, uh, little, um, I don't think um, I can be happier than that because I had your, your buddy, Jonathan, here uh, from One Side Thing, and now I have you and I get the possibility to interview you as well. So welcome to the What Man. Gabriele, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and just to have a dive into it. You, you pick up the pronunciation really fast. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> thank you. that was great. Okay, man. So let's get into it. Um, I want to know a little bit about your background. So can you tell me sure. the story of uh, what, what you did in high school and then in college and then how did you get into the position that you are right, uh, sure. right now? Sure. So my uh i was uh, born in korea came to the us when i was very young and i spent majority of my early childhood in southern california and during my time in southern california it was really a transformative experience because it's really allowed me to understand the the power of hard work right and that sounds super generic but i think as I reflect back on my story, one of the key things that stands out is how hard my parents have to work for me to have the opportunities that I have today, right? And that's one of the things that I think so many of us take for granted. But for me specifically, you know, my parents came to the US hoping for a better life for me and my brother. I, you know, they, they, they didn't have a lot of money they had to struggle, you know, work 10, 15 hour days every day to support me and my brother so that we could have the quote unquote American dream, right? And so as I was going through high school, the key thing that I always had in mind is saying, hey, you know, I see that my parents are struggling financially. I want to do what I can to help, but the most that I could do right now is study and as soon as I get a full-time job, as soon as I get real stream of income, that's when I'll help them, right? And so that propelled me throughout college where I uh, got in 2013 to Babson College, really small private business school. So, you know, the, the, the students there were just very different than what I was used to uh, growing up with. Um, and so Can during my- right there? Because sure, it, it, is, it, is, it is something that is very interesting for me. How did you get into Babson College from Southern California? Uh -huh. And why did you choose to go to the other, to the, to the other coast? You were in the Caliban. Why did you go yeah. to Babson College? You know, it's, um, you know, I have my interview answer and I have the real answer, right? My interview answer is, hey, you know, my passion was in business and there's no other place <laughs> than for me to go and be surrounded by like-minded individuals, right? But my real answer is... I want the real answer. Yeah, at the time, I didn't, I didn't know much about college research, right? I just chose the place that gave me the most amount of money that would have left me the least amount of debt. And I said, okay, right. Um, and so, and also I didn't get into my dream college. I wanted to go to USC. My brother went to UCLA. So I, I thought to myself, man, it'd be so perfect to have a family that's half UCLA, half USC. It would have been so funny to have that rivalry, but Fortunately, I, I just didn't get in. So the next thing I chose was, you know, the school that gave me the most amount of money. So it was a huge blessing in disguise because I, what I thought was uh, at the time I was going to my backup school ended up being the best decision I could have ever made. Great, great, man. And, and I, I totally relate to that because I, I, do, I did the same, right? I, I ended up in St. Peter's University from Italy and I... <laughs> I, did, I, I end up in Missouri Baptist first, but that's another wow. story. So yeah. can, can, you, can, you go, can you go a little bit? So when did you choose Babson College and what did you do in there? How did you get um, the passion for business? And uh, tell me a little bit about the college experience. What did you figure sure. out in the years? Sure. So the reason why I chose business is because uh, my dad is an entrepreneur he runs his own tire and wheel business. He still does to this day in LA. And so for me, it was, there was no close second choice, right? Like there was nothing else close. Maybe I would have gone down the route of psychological research, but that would have been like a very far second. And so I got into Babson thinking that I was going to do accounting because uh, I took my first accounting course. 
I got 97%. I thought I was really good at it. It was perfect. And then what I realized afterwards was how accounting did not fit my working style. Right. And so as I thought through my college experience, you know, there are two main themes that I really want to capture. The first part of it was, Hey, I want to make sure I'm financially independent from my parents. Right. So I spent my entire college career working every semester, every semester I had an off campus internship two days a week. What I would do is stack my classes, 8 AM, 5 PM to three other days. I would go into Boston, wake up at 6 AM hour and a half commute, I'll drive 30 minutes to the public transit, take an hour into the city, walk 10 minutes to my office, work until 5, 6 p.m., take the hour and a half commute back, and then I would go into my dinner, then I'd go into my club, you know, my club meetings, homework, and everything else, right? So for me, that was, that, that was pretty much my college career in a, in a in a, in a nutshell from a professional standpoint. And of course I sprinkled in a bunch of recruiting there. Mm-hmm. And how did you get, get, can you tell me a little bit of, of the recruiting experience you had in college? Did you get internships? Uh, what did you do? And sure. So every semester I got an internship. Um, and thankfully that started back in my sophomore year of college where I was the first quote unquote internship that I had was at a strategy consulting firm. It was very small, 16, 17 people. And they were just trying to get their business up and running. Right. And it was really, it was a great, it was a great experience because that gave me true firsthand experience of what it means to do Excel modeling. It gave me a true firsthand experience of understanding what it means to creating PowerPoint slides and all that stuff typical consulting skills. And so, um, and then every semester after that, I tried something different, right? I tried investment banking. I tried private equity. I tried business intelligence, so many more. And as a result of those experiences though, what I realized at the time, well, at the time that's allowed me to have fun, right? That gave me fun money for me to hang out with my friends, go on trips, go on road trips. Cause otherwise I wouldn't have had the money to do so. Right. But with those, with that in mind, one thing that really was, was what I realize now looking back is that when I got into my first job at Google, first full-time job out of college, I pretty much came in with three years of experience, right? The, the minute things of the little nuances of like figuring out, hey, this is how you work with executives. This is how you email your colleagues, this is how you create presentations. All those small skills I picked up on because of my internship. And so when I got in to Google as my first day, I already knew what all those nuances meant, right? And so that allowed me to start to drop sprinting and which allowed me to get promoted in my first promotion review, which I think was the fastest anyone's ever done in the organization. Not bad, man. Not bad. It was not like a little organization, right? <laughs> We're talking about Google. Yeah, that's right. So it was, it was really, really awesome to, to see that. Um, so, Great. you know, but again, like what I thought at the time was, uh, was a curse of thinking, man, all my friends are sleeping in at till 11 a.m. to go to the first class. I have to wake up at 6 a.m. for me to go to work so I can have enough money to do my thing. Right. That's that's all well, the work that you put in before in order to be better off later on. Yeah. And you know, again, it, it was a huge blessing in disguise. I, if I, if I, knowing what I know now, I would absolutely do that again. And for people who are in similar positions as I am, who are professionally driven, who want to climb up the corporate ladder, who want to do all those things, I would recommend you to do the same. But again, these are my personal experiences and like, Thankfully, I was able to maintain a high GPA. Thankfully, I still had friends and they didn't hate me and all that. So I, I really lucked out and I just had a great community that's allowed me to support that. Um, but but that one wasn't easy. It's great, man. And this is the result. You can see the results of hard work that nothing is is given, right? And so this is this is great. And that's um, congratulations for that. <laughs> so can you? Can you tell me the story since we talked about that? Can you tell me the story and how you got into Google? Uh, a little bit about that. Uh, how did you get in there? What was the interview process? If you remember, so even some fun stories that you had in there. 
the first recruiting season after college. Tell me about that. Oh, recruiting season after college. Uh, so after college, I didn't formally recruit heavily until only recently, actually. So I don't know when this podcast is going to go live, but I am, I've landed my next career outside of Google and I am really excited Congrats, about the opportunity. Thank you. So what that process looked like for me was, well, so let me back up there before I formally took on said, Hey, I'm going to dedicate time to recruit before then I would do reactive recruiting. Right. And reactive recruiting is this idea of how do you attract recruiters to your profile and your resume such that you don't have to do a single thing. They come to you with interviews. Right. And through this reactive process, I got interviews at Spotify, Netflix, DoorDash, TikTok, so many companies, you know, LinkedIn, because they were all the ones who reached out to me. Right. I did not do a single ounce of reaching out to them. So thankfully, in that sense, it's, it, it's allowed me to keep, top, keep on top of my recruiting strategy. And it's allowed me to continually stay, on, stay interview ready throughout my entire years of working. So every few months, I would have an interview. Only recently was it that I said, you know what? I'm going to fully take time to dedicate my time to recruit externally. And so as a result, I interviewed at uh, 11 companies. The top ones include Stripe, Facebook, LinkedIn, DoorDash, TikTok, Robinhood, and a couple more that I'm, that I'm, that I'm missing. But the process generally is, you know, get referred internally or have someone put your, have someone vouch for you internally and start the recruiting process that way. I've never applied to every, any single one of those to land interviews. That is great. And can you walk me through the process that you said before? You said reactive recru recruiting. How did you call that? Yeah, reactive recruiting. So I think a lot, so the opposite of reactive recruiting is proactive recruiting, right? It's me actively reaching out. Everyone all, always forgets about the opposite end, right? How do you get recruiters to come to you rather than you having to go out to recruiters? That's the difference. Man, I am so interested in that. Walk me through that. <laughs> step sure. one so, to step, step 100. Tell me yeah, everything. Absolutely. So the fact of the matter is, is that recruiters are looking to hire folks by using online tools today like LinkedIn. Even more so in a COVID environment because you no longer have the ability to go in person to host in-person events, right? So for me, the first time this had worked was when I was a a junior in college and I had a LinkedIn recruiter message me and saying, Hey, I love the work that you're doing. Let's set up some time to chat. Right. The way that you do this is creating as many opportunities as possible for someone to get to know you. Right. And so the way to go about this is like I always say first, well, well, mainly it's LinkedIn content, right? The more LinkedIn content that you have out there, the more opportunity you give people to then interact with you, right? And if how the LinkedIn algorithm works is that if someone interacts with your post, then your post will get shown to people in their network. And if someone in their network likes your post, then it'll get shown to their network, right? And it just goes on and on. So therefore, when you have this networking effect of pretty much hundreds if not thousands of people who inevitably or who may who might be interacting with your work what you have now are all thousands of people who know who you are and might potentially reach out to you right so that's the first part creating linkedin content the second piece of it is making sure that you have an optimized linkedin profile Right. And can we, can we stop right here and tell me a little more about the part one? What would you recommend to somebody to start off? Start off small, start off easy. Right. I think the first thing is that, well, first you have to realize before you even create posts that a lot of the self doubt, all that stuff is in your own mind. It's very mental. Right. Once you understand that it's an extremely mental, mentally mental process, then you have to understand, well, if I, if I believe in myself, if I have confidence that, hey, you know, I'm just going to try it, whatever, no harm, no foul, and you're not thinking, 
man, but what if someone judges me? What if someone in my network or my acquaintance, right, that I barely know, or what if someone at work notices my, notice my post, right? Isn't that going to be weird? If you're able to put all that aside and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to just try it. It's going to be fine. The world isn't going to break. Then you're ready to start your creating LinkedIn posts. Then comes the second part of trying to figure out what content you want to create, right? The way that I would think about it is just write about things that, you're, that interest you professionally, right? And if you don't, if you're still like, oh man, like I still don't know what to write about, then just write about this podcast, right? Be like, hey, Gabriele is an amazing podcast host. These are the two things that I learned. I recommend people to, re- or to listen to it, right? Because inevitably what happens if you do that is now you're adding value to other people who might say, oh, wow, you know, Gabriela does have an amazing podcast. Let me go and share with my network, right? And they might message you and say, hey, thanks so much for sharing, right? And that's how you start small. And inevitably, what's going to happen is you'll eventually find your own voice. And once you find your own voice, that's when the magic happens. Uh, let's say, thank you very much for that. And I know you, you didn't mean, probably didn't mean it, but let's say that Jerry is a wonderful guest more than Gabriel is a wonderful host. <laughs> but tell me, why, why do, can you tell me your process? How did you start writing? Uh, what was your first content on LinkedIn? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. So my first content, to be honest, I think was along the lines of personal finance. So I used to write a ton around personal finance and it's something that's very near and dear to me. And so I remember I posted content around that. I got some engagement, not really, but most importantly, I just wanted to share my passion for personal finance with others. Right. And so for me, it was a process in which I took and said, all right, I'm going to just go for it. And then inevitably personal finance then turned into professional development. Then professional development turned into one salting. Right. And so as I think about how this process worked, like it just evolved, but the main and most important thing that I thought I think really helped was just, just trying. Just do it. Just doing it. Just do it, man. Yeah, this is probably the most important thing that I'm a huge advocate for because I saw that on my skin and I didn't know what to write. I didn't know anything. Then I just started doing it. I can't remember what I what I did, but I was just start doing it and then drives engagement. I still at the early, early, early beginning of, of this, but I can see the potential of it. For and sure. So thank you for it. But uh, so you started about personal finance. Do you remember the timeline? Do you remember when did you start posting on LinkedIn? college right because in college they started reaching out to you already so in in terms of creating actual posts i started that a few months after i started college but in terms of using linkedin commenting on things interacting with people that's where uh that's where i was doing that in college and so i I think retracting back a little bit yes creating content is probably the most effective way but if you are really against creating content you can create mini content by posting on, posting on things, right? Because essentially you're still putting yourself out there. It's just that in a, different, in a different medium, right? So for me in college, that's how I started off. But as I'm looking back on my LinkedIn now, it's completely all two years ago. Wow, it's crazy. Two years ago I started. Personal development. So you were already in Google when you started that, right? That's right, yeah. Uh-huh. And, and how did you get, so, um, you, you said this was the first process. What, what, what was the second part? Do you remember? So the first process is creating content, creating content. The second part of it is interacting with piece, different people's content. I think kind of what I'm mentioning earlier that it doesn't have to be this formal, formal thing, glamorous thing. The second, it's really just putting yourself out there, the way they put yourself out there is either creating posts or interacting with people's posts. And those are what I would call mini pieces of content. Right. And it it doesn't have as strong as an effect, but it still does help. Great. And so you, you managed to do that and to get recruiters and hiring managers reach out to you, right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. And 
yeah so can you tell me the story and th that's wonderful um, I, th this, this is the uh, what is going to help a lot of people because they don't realize that they need to put their self out there when you know, you, you right and and and, it, and i think the the key thing there is that it it didn't just take me three three comments and then i suddenly got flooded with recruiters right that was almost four years ago now when probably LinkedIn engagement, LinkedIn content creation was not a thing. Right. And so I, I do want to caveat in saying that it wasn't the, it wasn't such an easy process. It wasn't just a post once boom results, right? It took consistency, right? Which is why I, I think the part of it is, is not just, uh, I can't wait to post so I can get my next job, but rather it's, I want to post so I can get, and maximize the impact for others. And once I do that, inevitably, things like recruiters will come in. Just do it and then everything is going to, to come to you. That's this right. is the philosophy. Great. That's right. So can you tell me, can you tell me about the, the, let's go back. And can you tell me the story and how you got into Google? Sure. So I got, so my time at Google was, um, I, I think, very unconventional. So Previous to me going into Google, uh, people, there was never a Google intern from my alma mater, right? And so thankfully, I guess in that sense, when I was even applying, I, was, I applied thinking, no way I could get in, never. No way I could get in. And so when I thought about it like that, it was just really interesting because at the time I just threw my application from an internship. I was like, whatever, I'm just, I'm just try it. I don't think it's going to work, but no harm, no foul. And so, but to my surprise, they reached out to me for an interview three, four months later. Right. And so that was, and then, it, and then pretty much the rest is history. Right. Then I unfortunately was offered the position. Then I got a full-time offer, a return offer, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, so, so that was an internship. It was an internship of how I got in. Exactly. And was during college. During college. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. When was during college? Do you remember that? Uh, 2013 year? to 2017. So my internship was in 2016. So four years ago. Uh -huh. So last year, junior year. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah. So, and then you got the return offer. That, exactly right. And then I started off my career as an analyst there. Mm -hmm. And do you remember the internship? What, what, what was it? And uh, what was the internship about? Can you tell me a little bit more about the interview process? If you have any story that you remember from that? Yeah. So I can't share the exact details of the questions or anything, but sure. the, the process is, is meant to design, is designed such that it, it tests on all cylinders, right? It's not just testing to see if you can answer a question right. They're trying to get to know you as a person, what motivates you, what drives you, right? What interests do you have? Why this internship, right? Because at the end of the day, the fact of the matter is, is that most people probably just want to work at Google because it's Google, right? And not because they have a true passion for what Google's trying to do, right? And even if they do have a true passion for what, what Google's trying to do, they're saying, yeah, hey, I'm interviewing for the Google ads team. But I love what Google's doing with their Google Photos app. I love what they're doing with Pixel. It's completely unrelated to their scope of work, right? And so, therefore, it's, it's a little... So, anyways, so, so that's what the process is designed to, to weed out, right? Is, or that's what I think it is. And so, that's the first part. The second part, I think, is really around, like, they test for your thought process, right? And that's such a generic term. And every, every, of course, every company does that. But that was the first time in which I felt like they were, they didn't read questions from a case book. Rather, they created a question that really tested to see whether or not I would actually do well at the job. And fortunately, they saw something in me and they gave me the opportunity. And so that's how I, that was the interview process. And what I actually did was the process analytics project where we were trying to identify so I was on the product abuse team and one of the problems that we're trying to solve for is how do we get more insights from our vendor teams that we've been working with and so I was creating a process I did a bunch of dashboarding analytics I learned SQL 
So that's that's what it was at the, at the highest level. Great. So you that was the internship, right? Internship. Do you remember what was the name of the internship you got in? in Google? It was a bold internship. At the bold internship. That's right. Great. Great. And so, okay. And can you tell me, so let's go into the, your career, how you figured out what you really liked. Mm -hmm. This is a very important point for, for people, students like me and students that are graduating as well. You started as an analyst and then you moved into your position now that is strategy and operations, right? Yeah. So how it worked was, so I started off as an analyst, was promoted to a strategist. Then six months after that, I transitioned orgs into being a strategy and operations manager and a year after that, I'm in my current role as a senior strategy and operations manager. Seems, seems like pretty fast track. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I had a very thankful, uh, grateful and speedy career. How, how, if I can ask, how old are you? Uh, I just turned 25 a couple months ago. 25 and uh, you're a senior strategy and operation manager, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I got really lucky. Yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. And uh, can, can, you th can we go a little bit into strategy and operations? What is that? Uh, how is a day of work look like? And what are your, your, your responsibilities, what you have to do? Don't, don't need to go into the Google. Oper we don't want to know what Google yep. does. But what, what are you doing? What, what is your specialization? What you like about that? What you don't like about that as a field? Right? Mm -hmm. So... What I do want to, so at a, at a philosophical level, at a principal level, what I do is I think about how we can accelerate the growth of our business, right? As we think about business expansion, as we think about growing the business revenue, how do we do that? And that's, that's pretty much how I would describe it. And so it's very cross-functional where I work with sales, I work with products, marketing or analytics, tools, finance to figure out, hey, what is everyone doing? What, but more importantly, where should we be going as a business, right? And how do we move forward? And so that's, that's what I do in a nutshell. So an average day could look like I'm crunching a bunch of numbers, right? Another average day could be like, hey, I'm creating a presentation to present to an exec team. Like I have one that I have scheduled for this Wednesday, it's the upcoming Wednesday, right? And so it, it varies, it vastly varies in, in spectrum. So, but that's how I would think about it, right? Crunching numbers, problem solving, creating presentations, and just, just trying to figure out how we move forward as a business. What kind of, what kind of numbers are you crunching? What, what, what are you looking at? Uh, what, do you, can, you, can you tell us like an example? Go, go like an example that you can maybe reveal. Sure. So the, at the highest level, we'd be looking at revenue numbers, right? So looking at customer data, looking at revenue numbers, what do they tell us about the business? How does that then inform the decisions that we make on behalf of the business? And more importantly, how do we land the changes, right? So we'd be thinking things like, hey, what does revenue growth look like across countries? And, but more importantly, once we look at that, what do we do about it? Mm-hmm. Great. Can you elaborate a little bit, a little, a little bit more? Sure. So what you might say after that is saying, okay, well, we look at revenue growth for each country. Where do we believe we're underinvested? Where do we believe we're overinvested? How much opportunity do we have in each of the markets? And are we capturing the full amount of opportunity? If we're not, why aren't we? Is it a product thing? Is it a sales thing? Is it a marketing thing? And for those reasons, how do we make sure that we have the right amount of balance in, in different investment areas, right? How do we know that it's not a marketing problem? How do we know it's not a sales problem, right? And so that, those are some of the questions that we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And ultimately, then we come up with a series of recommendations that we would go and implement. Mm -hmm. If you feel comfortable in doing that, can you, can you give us an example? So an example of this would be, uh, there's an idea that was driven by the exec team around, hey, how do we, how do we cross-sell a specific product that I'm working on at Google to the rest of the other business users at Google? And if so, what does that look like? Should we do it? How much opportunity is there? 
right? And so once we took that really ambiguous question, then we said, okay, well, let's figure out what exactly we're talking about here. What we're essentially talking about is saying, hey, can we, do we have cross-sell opportunities across the company? Then we said, okay, where specifically do we believe we can cross-sell across a company? We sized it and said, okay, if, we, if everything were to go perfect, we, we can capture X amount of dollars. But in order for us to make this happen, we need to have six people in these countries. We need to have these, these, these things from the tools team. We need to have this from the marketing team. We need to have this from the partner, from the finance team. And only then we can capture this opportunity. Then we go ahead and talk to other cross-functional stakeholders to say, hey, what do you guys think about this, right? And they might say, hey, I completely disagree. Then we go, okay, then that's where the negotiations happen, right? Like, okay, well, tell me a little bit of why you, why you think that, right? Like, are we looking at the wrong data? Is there something else that we missed here, right? And so that's, that's where the process really goes. But by and large, that would be the high-level example of what a project might look like. That, that is great. So it is uh, data analysis. You analyze uh, the data for a specific product or for a specific area that you're working on. That's you try right. to understand the numbers that are in there and then, uh, and then try to allocate different funds and money to different teams in order to make that product uh, go at the, be at the best of their capacity, right? Exactly, yeah. Wonderful. Uh, it's a very interesting job. And so, okay, uh, but closing down in strategy and operation and congrats on, on what you're doing because it is great. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not easy at all. Can you tell me a little bit about your passion project? Can you tell me a little bit about one salting one? Yeah, so one salting is what I would define as what I wish I had in college, right? Yeah. So it's, we are an organization to turn underdogs into winners, but more importantly, what that means is how we bridge the opportunity gap that we see from kids who go to Harvard versus kids who go to schools like Babson College or UC Riverside, right? Or St. I, Peter's University. Shout out to my school. <laughs> and so in, in my eyes, if you're an extremely, if you're in the top 10%, at Harvard, you're probably going to be very similar to a top 10% in Babson, right? And so if you were to believe that hypothesis, then you have to ask the question, well, why aren't companies, the top companies going to the top 10% at every university? The reason why? It's challenging. It's costly, right? If I was a recruiter and my entire exec team comes from Harvard, probably at companies like McKinsey, and I'll probably hire the top 50% at McKinsey instead of going to the top 10% at five schools. It just, it just costs less for me to do that, right? But what if we had a world in which that idea of finding the top 10% from 100 schools is now that wall has been broken down? What if we had a process in which where we can proactively identify these are the main candidates you should be looking at. I guarantee you 80% of them will pass your second round interview. Go interview them. Then would recruiters change their minds of the way that they go about recruiting? Would a lot of the biases that exist in recruiting today, would that be eliminated? I think so. So that's pretty much what I define as what one salting is and what we're ultimately trying to do. And that is a great mission. And what I'm trying to do in my little, little, little community, way more little than, than that, but it's the same thing because we need more opportunities for, for people that don't believe they can get an opportunity like that. That's right. We need to give them hope. We need to give them, even for myself, I didn't know, I, I don't think I can land a job at Google or at Facebook or Apple where I really want to work because of the name of the college that I come from. That's and right. I don't think that's the case. And you, if you work hard enough and yeah, maybe you can have a little bit more possibilities and you can have a little more, um, a little more, uh, yeah, possibilities if you come from Harvard or Stanford or those schools, but we need more opportunities for people from underdogs 
it's cool as that's well. right that's right. right can you can you tell me how you are you want to are you how you're doing and are you doing it and what is the process behind one side thing who can can join how can they contact you T tell me a little bit about one side sure so we interact with students and young professionals in three main ways the first piece of it is we interact through linkedin right that's our bread and butter we create content to not only inspire but equip people with the tools so that they can take full advantage of their career the second thing that we do is we partner with organizations where if they if you guys really want to bring us out and you want us to create a tailored presentation for your college email us right hello at onesultan.com and let us know that we are that you you're interested again that's hello at onesultan.com and most importantly if you're looking for extreme one-on-one -on -one, tailored very personal working relationships and you want us to literally rewrite your resume for you you want us to help you actually create your LinkedIn strategy tailored for you, hit us up again, right? Jerry at onesultan.com or hello at onesultan.com. In those three ways, that's, that's currently the world in which we're operating, right? And I think a lot of that is the constraint is based off of me and my business partner, Jonathan time. But we're essentially thinking about how we can maintain that same level of quality, but enable that at scale. That's great. And uh, yeah, one side thing is helping a lot and create, uh, even the guys at one side thing, Jerry, Jonathan, and everybody else in there, they are really helpful in order to uh, like the post that you're doing. If you tag them, they're going to respond most That's of right. the time. Obviously they have like a thousand notification each <laughs> second probably, but still, still they, they, they go and they go above and beyond for people. And they really, really like that. And th those guys are great. So I highly, Appreciate highly that. recommend one starting to everybody. Uh, okay, man, I don't want to steal more time from you because I know you, we have a little more time. Sure. Uh, so do you have any, uh, any resources apart from one side thing that you should, that you're recommending to students? Another, uh, uh, let's do this one first. Sure. The number one resource I'd, I'd say is people, 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 people reach out, get six different pieces of opinion. And let that then inform what you believe is the right way, right? But understand that what worked for me will not always work for you. And that's okay. And that's by design. So as you're thinking about your career, as you're thinking about what that looks like for your next step, reaching out to people is one of the most impactful things that you can do. Great. And that's true. This is everything is all about people. At the end of the day, right. everything is all about people. And do you have any regrets or something that you would do differently from the first, last year of college? I think the only thing I do differently is probably try more or more subjects. I think at that point, I still was going down the consulting route. But what I realized during my end of my senior year is I took my first coding class, my first Python class, and I absolutely loved it. And so one thing that I wish I did differently is uh, take more of those computer science courses much earlier on. I was, I, I understand that my, I was lucky enough to understand that during the, my sophomore year. <laughs> I, yeah. Because I started as a business administration major and then I saw that word and then I switched to computer science because right. I, wa I wanted to be able to do so. Yeah. So uh, analytical skills, very important and they're, they're cool. Sure. They're very cool to play with those games. So <laughs> that's right. All right, man. So cool. thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you being on the podcast. Uh, I had the complete consulting crew now, and I hope we can do much more work together. And uh, because I, I really support you guys in everything you do. And I, and I want to contribute more uh, to your cause because it's my cause as well. Awesome. Gabriele, I appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. Let's stay connected. Sure. Any parting thoughts? You know, I think uh, just if there's lasting thoughts, you know, here I'm able to say because I'm privileged to have gone through the process, I'm privileged to have had seen a little bit of early success in my career. But if there's anything that I would leave everyone with is just know that you can do it, right? That you don't need 
the approval of others. You don't need the, you know, you don't need to listen to that voice in your head that's telling you you're not good enough, right? Because you are good enough. And had I done that, my career would have looked very different. So keep that in mind, especially as you guys are thinking about growing up about your career and you'll be fine. And with that note, it is beautiful to close it down and to see you the next. Thank you, Jerry. See ya.